Leonard, when you first heard the data from the cosmological uh, observations that uh, dark energy may be 70% of reality and there was this potential cosmological constant, what did it do to your worldview? Well, it was completely stunning. Um, a tsunami, just, uh, just something overwhelming. The reason, though, is not the fact well, the reason was a little bit confused and confusing. We were all so confused that to look back on it now, it just seems like we were thinking all the wrong things. Uh, the question is not why there is dark energy. Theorists and physicists have understood for many years that quantum mechanics and quantum field theory create dark energy. Dark energy being the fluctuations in the vacuum and so forth. The real question is, why is there so little of it? What happened was theoretical physicists realized that it was almost zero, that there was a negligible amount of it, so they convinced themselves that someday they would have an explanation of why it was exactly zero. They Which is took, easy to explain. A zero is easy. Well, they <laughs> thought that, easy, that zero yeah. should be easy to explain. They never explained it. <laughs> they never explained it. They thought, oh, it must be exactly zero, and there must be some principle that we don't know about, probably in string theory, that will make it be exactly zero. So string theory will have the solution. That's the solution. Aha, uh -huh, we've explained it. <laughs> that was the logic. <laughs> that was the logic. Um, then the real world... Then the real world came and said, there is a little bit of dark energy. All right? The physics and the science of it said that there should be dark energy. But as we understood that physics and science, it should have said there's a huge amount of dark energy, not this terribly little bit. So what's mysterious is not that there's dark energy. What's mysterious is that there is so little of it. So how do we deal with that mystery? Well, the only thing that we can connect it to, this terribly tiny number, is that if it were very much bigger, we wouldn't be here to ask the question. If there were much more dark energy, and remember what dark energy does, it has a repulsive character to it. It makes everything repel. The re part of our own existence is dependent on the existence of planets and stars, for example. How did they form? They formed by gravity pulling them together. If there was this repulsive character to this cosmological constant, it would have retarded the condensation of the galaxies and the stars and the Earth and so forth. If it was strong enough, it would completely uh, prevent it. Well, the answer was that if the cosmological constant was just a little bit stronger than the amount that we detected, it would have prevented stars, galaxies, Earth, and presumably us from forming and being here to ask the question. So that's the only thing we know how to connect it to, our own existence. Th that's a, uh, a, a radically different approach to, to science. Yes, of course, it's not mine. This was a point that was made many years ago by Steven Weinberg. Uh, and it is a radically, well, yes and no. Yes and no. If uh, we were to ask the question, why is the temperature of the Earth what it is? Why is it in a very, very narrow range where life is possible? I think most of us would say, that's a stupid question. Of course it's in the narrow range where life was possible. If we were on a planet where life was not possible, we wouldn't be there to ask the question. And I think we would agree that that's the answer. I hope, anyway. So I would say it's not all that radical. What's radical is the use of it in this particular context. Well, the, the difference conceptually as we start is that we know for a fact that there are other planets. We see them. Yeah, yeah. We see them. Yeah. And now we know there are hundreds of extrasolar planets right. and no doubt yes. a, a, a virtually yes. a, a, an incredibly large number. Yeah. So, I mean, this is something part of our world. Yeah. We know that they yes. exist, but we only know that one universe exists by right. the same observation. Right. So you put your finger on exactly what the problem is for physicists and cosmologists at the present time. That, yes, we know about all this diversity that's out there. We see it. And we have no hope whatever of seeing the diversity of the multiverse that may be out there. We have no hope of seeing it. It's just too far. It's moving away from us. It's beyond horizons and so forth. And that's what we have to contend with.
why is it so obvious that there should be dark energy? What is it about the laws of quantum mechanics that would cause energy in absolutely empty space? Right. Uh, it's the uncertainty principle. For example, supposing you had a particle on the end of a spring. We call those harmonic oscillators, particles which could just vibrate back and forth. Um, Classically, without quantum mechanics, you can imagine that particle just standing still with the spring uh, being as short as possible and just not moving. It would have no potential energy, it would have no kinetic energy. Standing still, at rest, no velocity, no uh, displacement. Well, the uncertainty principle says that's impossible. <laughs> it says you can't know both the position and the velocity. They would have to fluctuate. Because they have to fluctuate, that little oscillating thing has to have some energy. The same is true in many contexts. So one context would be the electromagnetic field, the field that makes light. Uh, electric fields and magnetic fields also have uncertainty principles, and they have to fluctuate. Well, that little bit of fluctuation has energy. How much energy? Well, that depends on how big, meaning how big in space, the fluctuation is. The smaller in space the fluctuation is, a little tiny fluctuation in space, has more energy than a big overall fluctuation. Right? So physicists calculate how much vacuum energy, how much energy should be there in the oscillating, electric, magnetic, and all the other fields of physics, and they calculate that each different size scale would produce a certain amount of energy. If you start at very long scales, not much energy. You start going towards smaller and smaller scales, more and more fluctuation on smaller and smaller distances, you discover more and more energy. If you only took into account, for example, up to wavelengths or up to sizes about as big as an atom, mm -hmm. That would give you enough energy in the universe to create a cosmological constant which was vastly bigger than we can tolerate. Well, an atom is not very big. We think we know the laws of physics down to atomic size. We think we know how to calculate how much vacuum energy is there, and it's much too much. We can go past atomic size. We can go to nuclear size. We still think we know what the physics is. We start calculating, then we find out that the, uh, that the vacuum energy is enough to completely explode every atom, every molecule in nature, just by blowing it apart. And if we push that logic all the ways down to the shortest distances, which we think we understand, the energy stored in those fluctuations would be vastly, vastly bigger than, uh, than anything we can tolerate. What does that mean? Is, is, is there some inconsistency well, with the laws of quantum mechanics? <laughs> um, let me tell you, first of all, if you were to calculate these things in ordinary quantum field theory, the answer would come out just plain infinite. And the reason it would be infinite is you can go down smaller, to smaller and smaller. and smaller wavelengths. There's a story about this. I don't know if anybody knows it but me. I wasn't there, but I heard the story. Paul Dirac, who was one of the greatest quantum physicists of the world uh, ever, uh, said, well, if it comes out infinite, I don't believe in it. Probably doesn't mean anything. And Wolfgang Pauli, who was also a very, very great physicist, said, Paul, just because it's infinite doesn't mean it's zero. <laughs> uh, and that's exactly the way uh, it uh, sort of worked out. Physics evolved. Paul Dirac thought it didn't mean anything because it was mathematically came out to be infinite. As we un now understand quantum field theory, there's some small distance that we should do these things down to. It's called the Planck distance, and not beyond that. And we would get a finite answer. The finite answer would be very much bigger than, uh, than what we see. So uh, what do we do about it? Well, when I say it was very much bigger than it should be, you have to be a little bit careful. There are various contributions to it. The electric field contributes to it. The magnetic field contributes to it. The Higgs field, whatever that is, contributes to it. The electrons field contributes to it. They all contribute, some with positive sign, some with negative sign. Conceivably, they could all add up and cancel out. But that would require a fine-tuning, and that would require a 
degree of precision and fine-tuning far beyond anything we ever imagine. So one possibility is that for reasons unknown, the parameters of physics happen to be tuned in precisely the right way so that all of this vacuum energy just happens to cancel out. But we don't have any reason to believe, we don't have any theory that explains why that's so. So the answer is that without all this tremendous fine-tuning, the calculations that physicists do would expect, you would expect, a very large dark energy, many orders of magnitude bigger than what you see.